All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we are now uh, uh, thrilled to to bring you into the first keynote, which uh, will be by Anna Westerling. Um, a short introduction to Anna Westerling before we dive right into the topic, because Anna will also introduce herself. Um, Anna Westerling um, owns and operates Westerling PR and event as well as does work for uh, Free League Publishing, which is a very popular publisher of Tales of the Loop, Morkburg, and other um, role-playing games. I know Anna, I've probably known Anna for 12 years um, since I played in her Jane Austen Sense and Sensibility adaptation called Growing Up, which you can find for free online. And it is Sense and Sensibility, the LARP, the role-playing game. It is so incredibly enjoyable. Um, but since that time, uh, she's gone on to produce, um, actually before, before I met her, she had done a event called A Nice Evening with the Family, which uh, is effectively a collision of different Ibsen and Strindberg and, and other um <laughs> other uh, scandinavian uh, depressing plays all together in a, in a in a larp scenario um uh, that organized around thomas winterberg's festen or or the celebration sorry and then um and then she also founded the stockholm scenario Fe festival which she may talk a little bit more about um so in in hindsight uh, we asked Anna Vesterling because she has had a career working between um, very indie experimental scenes and very commercial scenes, as well as um, sort of the nonprofit, uh, you know, state funded sector and and also uh, mainstream uh, uh, publishing and performance. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you to Anna Westerling's keynote, which is entitled Dramaturgy in Interactive Storytelling. Hello and welcome everybody. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm, I come from Sweden, so I'm in Sweden now, so I'm very excited to meet you all. If, uh, if anything I say is weird or like because of, you know, we come from different places in the world and maybe I think you understand something you don't please let me know and we can go from there. Okay, so dramaturgy in interactive storytelling. Let's jump right into it. But yeah, first I had of course my own presentation about myself. Now Evan has done it very lovely, but I would, this is my long like list of stuff that I have done, different type of things. And I would like give you a context. I began to LARP in 96 and has been doing it since. And a lot of this stuff I've been doing is non-profit. Maybe I got in a bit paid, maybe often not. And, you know, it's been my hobby and my passion for many years. And at around 2000, I started to go to conventions and discovered what I call free form, role playing, sometimes deep form. Um, and I think Evan said in here it's called semi LARP or parlor games. It's basically you go into a classroom and you don't have costumes and you pretend to be someone else for maybe four hours, like a role playing game, like a cousin of tabletop role playing games. And um, so that's been my like two big, big uh, passions in life. And Eventually, I broadened out a bit to tabletop role-playing game and I began to work with Free League doing the dice thing and experimenting with dice and seeing what that is. Uh, and then, of course, I've been active doing conferences, books and LARPs. And scenarios is what I define as more role-playing, free-form, shorter parlor games. And as Evan said, at some point, if you've done a lot of events, you kind of float over to... to professional and that's what I've done and have my own company where I've done living theater and parties and also do free leagues convention presence where I do their events so for example at Gen Con coming up soon so this is me um, most of these games can be found for free online if you want to play them okay then I'm going to jump into dramaturgy in interactive storytelling why, why would you want dramaturgy? Like most games are 
sandbox games, I would say, both like tabletop and also say big LARPs. It's like we have this uh, we have this place, run around and be characters and see what happens. It's a very like randomized thing. I don't, I'm not saying here it's bad. I'm just saying it's, you know, you can strike gold and you can have super fun or, or you can not like. And then of course it's the pleasure of exploring the sandbox and that's enjoyable. Otherwise you do it with dices on a table or running around in a big fantasy forest. Uh, so that's fun. But can you as an organizer plan dramatically for these players more than like, hey, I build this awesome world where you can run around and do things. Can, can you get them just like, you know, when you have a movie or a book to, to follow a dramatical curve? So like this happens then, this happens then, and then they cry at the end or then they're happy. And what, what kind of emotional experience would you want to give them? And of course, these are not like the lines are not super strict here. Everything could be a bit blurry. But that is what I'm asking about. Can you as an organizer give something more planned to guarantee a dramaturgical experience? So this is what I've been exploring in different ways. And this is what this talk will be about. So first we have, when you create a LARP or any type of interactive experience, you have the world. And I'm not the world builder. There's many, many talks with world builders that are better, but you have, you know, in the world you have a setting for example, where in the Harry Potter world can be a setting or we're in a fancy LARP or we're in the Stone Age or 70s collective. Uh, there are some norms and rules in these worlds and maybe some rituals like before you propose, you need to dance and give a flower or read the poem or whatever. It may be for rituals like this that can create games. But that's like the basic stuff if you have an interactive experience. Then you have, besides the world, you have the time frame, like what happens when at the LARP. So that's something I'm going to come back to the time frame because that you can experiment with. And then you have character levels. So you can affect the LARP on all these levels. So now we're going to jump into this. Since the world is not my expertise, I'm not going to talk about that, about that but I'm going to jump into the time frame. So let's see, time, what can you do with that? So if you have a wedding, for example, something very common in our culture, it usually has like a dramatic, like now I'm talking off LARP, off game, ordinary mundane wedding. So usually it's some kind of, and of course, I don't know, maybe people have done it differently. Usually it's some kind of ceremony. Sometimes it's religion, religious, where it's like, you know, some kind of a bit more atmospheric and you're like, yeah, a bit more serious kind of atmosphere. And then it's the dinner, maybe with speeches. And then it's the party, kind of, very simplified. And we all know that at the party, you can be drunk and joyfully go and hug the, the, the bridal couple and be like, I'm so happy for you and sob or whatever. But maybe not during the ceremony. That's not really fitting there. The ceremony should be more like, yes, oh, very happy for you. This was fun, something. So there's different kind of rules during this acts of a normal wedding and of course you can apply the same for interactive experience and LARP what different rules do you have for these acts and now I'm going to go to call them acts because in a wedding you can call them like the first ceremony act church or whatever kind of thing you do dinner it's usually a dining hall party so there's different locations connected to this too so different acts. So how do you do this in storytelling? So you create acts, you give them name and themes. Uh, like, yes, first act, we're all gonna be happy. So it's the happiness act. The second act, we're gonna be a little sad. And the third act, we're gonna be really sad. Very like <laughs> easy, you know, from happiness to sadness. Or maybe you can do it the other way around from being sad to being really happy if you want the LARP to be like that. I will give examples on different acts. But you give them name and themes and you instruct the players. You need to tell the players this, no, no secrets. Like, this is what we're doing. This is what this game is about. Um, and 
to introduce this act, you can do events to the overall group. And here, for if we go back to the wedding example, it's the big event of the ceremony in the church. That's a super event to create that we're all a bit more mm, solemn and a bit more ah oh, thinking and so on. Uh, but you can also do, as in the picture here, speeches uh, or performances or anything to like mark. And that's and give play give the characters information that something is happening and so on. But you can also, of course, send them to the individuals. Like we had, and I don't remember what the act was called, but it was it was like the last act that was a bit now every ah what's the word um, a bit of melancholy. So we started the act with sending all the men at the LARP a letter that tomorrow they were going to go to back to war. This was 1914 or 1915 in England. So of course that put a kind of atmosphere, the, the happiness went down because everyone was going back to war. But this um, also meant that it wasn't just, it didn't just affect the group on an overall level, it affected you as an, your character individual, you would be on the train tomorrow. So I would say that's two different kind of methods to use how to implement this. And then of course you can change the rules. I think classic on this is in the bit of violence, like if someone's fired a gun at you, of course it's an unloaded gun here, like just for clarity, a gun at you at the fir in the first act, you, it just misses you and you will laugh and it will be fun. If one you know, fires a gun at you and in, in the last act you die. So then you can have that kind of, in the beginning it's fun, the last act you die. You can also have it with food like in the beginning, all food is super nice. And in the end, it's disgusting or the other way around. Like you can like change the rules on how people need to behave. And this of course can be enforced the atmosphere you want to create with scenography and music that you remove things, you do stuff and so on. Um, and then acts also allows you to do time jumps. So you can change time like the first act is set in summer, the second act is set in autumn, and the last act is set in winter or whatever. So that was the acts. I'm see I'm having, nope. yes. So here are some examples on acts from four different type of LARPs. And um, we have Hamlet that was held in 2002 and then later has been held again in, I think, 2015 and so on. Um, it's the story of Hamlet, like from the Shakespeare play. And then the acts are decadence, so party away the first act. And the second act is intrigue, is like plot, plot to, with each other. And then the last act is you should all die because this is Shakespeare and Hamlet and tragedy. So it's a very easy, like, make sure your character dies in the end because that's what happened in Hamlet. Um, so that's that. And then we have, of course, a nice evening with the family. That's about a family as fair uh, and family secret. So the first act is family facade. Everything is lovely and oh, it's so lovely. And then the second act is things are starting to flow out. And then, of course, the third act, the demons are out and so on. So there's like you can do them very differently. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk through the last two as well. Uh, and if we see, for example, just a little loving, it's about when uh, HIV and AIDS come to New York in the 80s. And then the first act is played in 1982. And then it's friendship. So then everyone is like, oh, we're happy, we're a friend. It's very happy, go lucky. And then uh, the second act is paranoia because now the, the seeds have begun to come and no one knows what's this disease, how does it spread? Maybe we should just, you know, not touch. No one knows really. And then of course the last act is death because people were killed of this disease. So, and I'm also seeing the trend here. It's very like generally the Nordic LARPs, maybe it's because we're Nordic and dark. We like the like curve that go down uh, and I don't know. I would like to see a LARP where it's like, you know, from sad to happy. So you leave the LARP in like, oh, everything is awesome. But I don't know. I've yet to see it. So I can challenge you if you're more, more positive to do it. 
Uh, and then the Fair Weather Manor Christmas Special 1914, it's based on uh, the Downton Abbey series. So it's England 1940. And then the, we, we, there we succeeded to do a bit different. We succeeded at least to do worry that people are worried about the thing, uh, about the war and everything, how will it be? And so on. And then we had some event to mark that no, everything right now it's good. We're having Christmas. We had Christmas presents and Christmas trees and you know all of those type of symbols. Uh, so we were super joyful. I think this is the most joyful I've been at the LARP. It was like everyone was there, everyone was good. And then of course we realized they need to go back to war. So then it was melancholy. So this is four example of act structures. As, as you see, they're quite, you know, you can't be super precise. You're like sad, happy, or like, yeah. So there's, they need to be kind of clear, this act. You can't really go, yeah. Okay, so that's the act structures. And then what does the act allows you to do? Why would you want to use this? Because to focus on what, what story am I telling with this LARP? What, what, what do I want to achieve? Like, and synchronize your players. So, you know, they're all on the kind of same level. We don't have the, the drunk aunt in the, the ceremony at the wedding ceremony in the beginning. The drunk aunt shows up at the third act when we're at the party and everyone has gotten something to drink. So, so we kind of get the same kind of uh, everyone knows where we're going and people don't play on different things. And it also gives you the possibility to shift time and place. So you don't need to be in the same kind of, you can say that between, uh, between um, let's say this act, it has passed, um, um, uh, a year has passed, some month have passed or something, time has passed. And you can also say you're in a totally different place. Uh, and this, of course, also means you can practice non-linear storytelling. This is also a challenge that it has been like the LARP Delirium in Denmark 2010 did this when we kind of jumped around. But like I'm thinking I still miss the Pulp Fiction of LARPs. When does this come <laughs> where we like do non-linear storytelling? So this were the acts. And, and like the time, how you can control your time in LARP. And of course, as the wedding example, it's quite, you know, if you make a wedding or a party, you're also doing this kind of, what happens when, do I want to do a little performance here? Do we want to do a speech? How do, but here we do it to give a dramatic curve. So that's what then, and then I'm gonna to go to character level, but I'm also, there was, were there some questions in the chat because I don't see that. No one says anything. Then I'm just going to continue. Awesome. Character level is because, of course, we have we have the world, we have the time, but can we go in and mess like with the characters? If I want you to sign up to my LARP to have a dramatic experience, how can I do that? Can I do that? And of course, then I jump right into yeah. Um, and yeah, so this gives me also the possibility to adapt stories and not just the setting of a LARP. Usually when it's like, oh, this is a Harry Potter LARP or this is a Battlestar Galactica LARP or this is a Western LARP or whatever. It's mainly, you know, we steal the setting or we borrow the setting, which I think is, we should absolutely do this, but can we, can we get the story that this, this movies or books is about? How do I get that type of story? and affect people directly. So then I'm jumping right into the sense and sensibility adaptation I did. Um, and I got to rewrite it actually. Uh, so this is the Swedish version that you see the image of that I did for the National, uh, National Theater. Um, anyhow, Sense and Sensibility is a book by Jane Austen from 1811. So it's an old book and I was like, okay, can I make this book into a freeform game? And with my usual like, how hard could it be? It took some work. Um, I, I made it into a game and it's what I did as a designer is I analyze the book, I read it, and then I create playable scenes, just as in a movie. 
I read Emma Thompson who wrote the Sense and Sensibility, the movie script for the 95 version, I think. I read her diary and it's kind of a similar kind of work. What scenes are good to do, um, do in a role playing settings? Because of course you can't do, in, in books it's like, yeah, and then they walked and they walked and they walked and you're like, yeah, in my classroom here where I have people playing out this on the floor, this walking, no. Uh, how, how, do I, how do I find good playable scenes? And the next is, of course, like in role playing games and free form games or parlor games, semi LARPs, that you play in a classroom or a room where you close the door and then you act out scenes on the floor without costume. Um, you, you don't want to, you know, some books we have one main character and then maybe two small characters and then there's lots of really, really small. To, to make it into role playing games, all four or five people in the game need to have about equal kind of set stage. So, so you can't take any book, but luckily for me, this Jane Austen book worked. So I chosen five characters, but I also, when I selected which scenes I should have, uh, I made, you know, I maybe lifted some of the minor the, the small of those five, I lifted some of the smaller characters and I also cut away a lot of extra characters because it's not fun to have a lot of, hey, here this random person coming in again. Of course, you can do a bit of NPCing, but you want to keep it as tight as possible and as tight knit. So a story, I here I said three to seven because seven is like maximum you can be in a group before it will get too much people, but four to five, I think is ideal. So, and then you play it and this can be played during four hours with one game master. And then I'm like setting scenes. So I want you to, in the library, you do this. And then, I, and the instruction in this, um, in this pamphlet, in this scenario is the scenes are very much, you play this scene, these characters are in, this is the purpose I want this scene to achieve. So as a game master, you like set the scenes and I think it's about 25 scenes, 20, 25. Um, so, and if you do this of a book, which I absolutely think you should, <laughs> because it's fun, kind of fun. I would also say, you know, besides making sure to select something that has characters, four or five characters that are about the same, watch out for secrets in character, like, uh, or, that we, we in, in sense, and sense, sense and Sensibility, there's a character who has uh, made someone pregnant prior to the book. Of course, our, our heroines doesn't know this <laughs> and this will come out and be, you know, be bad for him. So when I rewrote it, I actually wrote in his character like, yeah, you met some girl, it was fun, you moved on. So, so kind of the player still knows something happened so you don't shock them with, oh, by the way, your character does this thing. So you need to like make sure all characters know their backstory. This also have written characters now. So you kind of read your character, what's it about? And then you play. I also did letter handouts as an homage to Jane Austen since she loves to work with letters. And then you can also just rip, you know, you can use her own text. Uh, and so that's how to adopt a book into <laughs> a work of art. So, but if you do bigger than, if you do LARP, like here are four or five people, then you can do, but if you want to do more, okay. Then we come to a nice evening with a family that Evan talked about, that's based on Thomas Winterberg's Festen and has lots of plays by Ibsen and Strindberg and more Nordic writers in it. Uh, and we actually experienced with having an American play in it as well. Uh, August Osage Country by, oh, I don't know, Tracy Letter. Yeah, anyway, so, so then you take theater plays and theater plays has the advantage since they're written for stage, they can't have too many random roles because that will be a very expensive production. So writers have generally tried to cut it down to a like limited number of plays. Nevertheless, there are a lot of theater plays that don't work at all that I selected the way that I'm like, no, no, this doesn't work. You need again, about, uh, like uh, a play with about five characters that all kind of interweave. They can be done with other, but you need to, yeah. And 
it turns out that Ibsen is a bit of an expert of writing role-playing friendly <laughs> plays. Um, so how do you do then if you're going to have like seven play playing out interactively next to each other and so on? Well, you create acts because that's kind of my first go-to. And then we have the acts. Since this is a LARP about family secrets, we have the LARPs, the, uh, the surface is all right, everything is awesome. And then the surface is starting to break and then the demons are up. So those are kind of, um, and then you have people in their groups of play, like, okay, so we are gonna play this A Doll's House by Ibsen uh, or the celebration by Thomas Winterberg. Okay, how do we do that? Well, then you read the play together. And I'm also kind of have a bit of a theater background. So I like this reading aloud the play because then you kind of get into. And here, if you are a LARP organizer and don't like to write characters, this is also very convenient because you don't need to write any characters. You like read the play and you can also figure out how the LARPs end, figure out your character and how the LARP end in one go. So after we read, read the play, we interpreted it. And that meant that we made action plans. So like, okay, in act one, I'm gonna be super flirty with my husband and we're gonna be super cozy. In act two, he's gonna cheat on me. And in act three, I'm gonna be super furious with him. And we didn't do it so that you would say lines from the actual play, but more like, okay, what is the essence that needs to happen to make this story work? because we all know where we're gonna end. So, and then in those cases, because of course there were some cases when there were characters who were less, we could try to make them bigger and like, okay, how do we include you so that everyone has some action uh, in the, during the like LARP. And the pictures with the whiteboard and all the post-its, that's exactly what we're doing there. Then they, we have the characters and what they're gonna do each act I think this is the first act they were like you know what do you want to do the first act and they could write how many they wanted and everyone wrote a few and then I got with the red pen I got them to write like what's one word that you're going to remember that you're going to like work with this act and then I think the the yeah the first character he has right power and someone writes smooth and so on and it's also because of course when you larp you can't remember everything but you can like remember okay i'm going to be power this act um, so that's how we did like and this of course also create ownership to the place so that it's your story it's not like it's not ibsen anymore <laughs> he wrote this but now we are doing an interpretation us uh, and the, the whole event was uh, Friday, Sunday, or like, yeah, you arrived during two, two days, basically. You arrived during the first evening and you left during lunch, the, the second, third day, second day, however, yeah. Uh, so the first evening you spent as with the whiteboard to the left where you prepped. And then the second evening, it was the nice evening with the family. It was a dinner. That's the picture you see on the other side with the people having dinner and wine and it's actually taken the, the door it's the same place these pictures are taken so it was like very prep and then play and one act was four hours long so they were yeah in LARP terms quite short and the whole LARP was about 12 hours so like you have four hours to do this mission and make sure you talk with who you're going to talk to and of course in the prep work we also build relationships and how, how to make them uh, and then we played a lot of scenes uh, like, okay, how, how would this happen? And the fun, the nice things with plays is that you have a story and then you can like, okay, so, but before, like, and usually Ibsen plays have a lot of secrets in the past or a lot of these plays actually have like, in the past this happened. So of course, then we would play out, how did it look like in the past? Or what if futures, what if someone would choose this? How would that look like? So one could, we jumped around quite heavily and improvised different kind of scenes of things. So that's the recipe of a nice evening. And I'm, uh, people have been like, yeah, but this should be able to be done with Shakespeare plays or any type of like, you know, someone said, talked about an American, a nice evening, because of course you guys also have a very good play tradition. Like can, can one, and I'm like, yes, do it. <laughs> Uh, but I done the dark Nordic one with the family secrets. 
awesome. So that was a nice evening with the family. And now, yeah, this is another LARP that I made and another example on how to, to work with acts. This is Love Stories by ABBA because I love ABBA music, which is a Swedish kind of pop 70s band. And I was out walking and listened a lot to their lyrics and like these lyrics are about relationships. Uh, this is like very, say a lot about people's relationship with each other. So then I began to sew it together into a LARP. <coughs> and this is a four hour, what we call in, in Sweden at least, black box LARP. That is, you have a big black box where you have, can work with light and sound and things like that. Um, so, so yeah, and then you LARP, so you're up on the floor. And to make it easy for me, or like, no, no, to, to make the LARP work, I created five characters. A, B, C, D, very simple. Uh, and those characters, they didn't get much character. There's like, yeah, you're the, the star, you're the one who writes the song, you're the merge person. It was very, very cliche and very easy. And then I did the different acts. Uh, I divided into acts, of course, and one act is about half an hour. Uh, and those acts were like, you could do some LARPing in a bar in May. Then I said, it's a month each act. So it's May, June, July, August, September. So you do some like bar LARPing where you explore these relationships with these other people that you have. And then you do singing to ABBA music. Um, and that, and uh, um, then you kind of, yeah. So you have like, as I, if you see up in the, in the image, it's, this is actually half the LARP script that you see here. It's not a very long LARP script. So act one, May, expectations. You're expecting how much is gonna happen. The first night of the tour, amazing performances. This is the summer is happening. So this is like the theme of the act that I'm giving them here. And this is also on the projector. There's a projector there, so it's like big screen. So they're like, okay, first act. And then you go into this bar and you LARP around with your band and your different friends. And this is the evening where A and D meet, sings Honey Honey and leave the bar together. So there I have like A and D, you will meet and you will sing this quiet, romantic song and you will leave the bar together which is since this was like 70s band this is code for sex or some kind of more romantic exploration together so this was this is super super scripted like a and d you will do this and so every every act you were going to sing a song and leave the bar together or, or and do something like we have more e reflex on life and money sings money money and <laughs> B and C, which is a couple from the beginning, remember the last summer and so on. So it's very like scripted. Uh, and I also remember, realized, I should mention that the singing, it's, um, it's, I like to sing, but when I sing, it may not sound super beautiful to other people by some, so I was like, I want people to feel they're singing awesome. So it's sing along, no microphones, and you have the lyrics on a projector, as you see in the image there, people get to stand in the spotlight and sing. And of course, it gets super interesting when you get to say, sing, say, the winner takes it all to the person that cheated on you, and so on. Because that's the theme of that song. Um, so that's kind of, and. The, it's very transparent. You get kind of the script from the beginning. In act five, this is what's gonna happen. And then you have about a half an hour to do it. So then I kind of used music instead and more kind of karaoke-like kind of fun. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a four hour kind of thing on how to also then control people dramatic curves. And I don't interfere in how they play the characters. Like A and D, A and D you should meet and you should sing honey honey and then you should go, go home together. W w how your relationship looks further than that, you're free to explore. And this is also then 
that everything is transparent. I give them everything from the beginning. I'm like, this is the LARP script. Now you know as much as I do. So I think that's the transparency is the trick here. So yeah, this is another way to create dramaturgy <laughs> with acts. And, and also what I do is that I have several groups. We don't have five characters. We have 25 and we have five A's and so on. And then they're all in the same room bar together. So then I can get more people than just the five in my Jane Austen story. Okay, so that's that. Um, okay, so I think this last, yeah. See what time is it? Yeah, no, uh, this is another way on how to create like more directed dramaturgy for your, uh, for your players and so on. And it is to, to do scenes with them. And the most common, I would say, in some kind of free form parlor games role playing is that it's scenes. You're going to play this scene, that scene, that scene, and so on. Bam, bam, bam. The written and the game master, you know, tells this is going to be the scene and sets the scene and then they play out. But people have experimented with this. And I'm going to mention 183 Days as an example, which is an American game. Uh, there you get a deck of cards and you're two people. And then you like turn the card and you're like, oh, now we're going to do this. And then you do that, and then you turn the card again, and so on and so on. Uh, and I think you do it together. And another game is called Riasan or The Journey, where you have four people, and then there, everyone has a bunch of paper, and you like turn the page. Oh, there's a new instruction for the new scenes. So that's also a way how to remove the game master, but still do the scenes. And a game called The Range that is about music, that is the photo here on the, the lower photo. There you have all the scenes set up in like a music and you can just take the scenes which you want to play. And all of the above are like for four or five people, they're quite small. And of course, I have, I have a toyed with the idea of doing the, the kind of take scenes from the wall in a bigger setting than four people, but I haven't really you know, figure out if and how, but that's also a way to like do scenes. Okay. And then of course, since I'm a Jane Austen fan, if you haven't figured that out, <laughs> I wanted to like, uh, try to be like, okay, can we do a big Jane Austen LARP? And this is like a LARP for 150 people in full Regency costume. How do I do that? And I worked with quite small groups like uh, and I see evening it was 40, 50 people. The Abelarp is 25, 30. Sensibility is like four. So I was like 150, how do I do? So in my first thoughts was of course, but I do like a nice evening, easy PC. And then it's like, hmm, no. The Austin books are thick as opposed to um, uh, Ibsen plays who are more like condensed. So the, the books are thick, so we can't expect the players to read them. Uh, so how, how do we do that? So, so instead this and here I'm going for a bit looser approach that I'm experimenting with, but instead we did, okay, how do you create your own Austin story? So we did um, three acts, of course, always acts, always acts. Uh, three acts uh, where we did first act was spring, which is like romance. And here we were like, come and fall in love. And the second act was, um, uh, of course, mess this up somehow, mess up whatever love story you build, create so many problems and drama and so on. And the third act is, of course, maybe you learned something, you know, because often Austin Herons learn something and move on. So this was a looser design. So, but to not like make this who takes who in the Austen setting when people need to find a romance, you know, someone to play romance with. We divided people up into what we call two romance groups. So you were like eight people in a group and our hope was then that you would take care of each other. Uh, and um, then you had like, it was a circle in that group. So everyone had two romantic relationships to start with. Uh, and then we had a lot of off time where you could plan all of this. So you would like know how to, how, 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 how do we create romance? And of course with two partners, you can bounce between them a bit. And like, yeah, now I like you, no, I like you, yeah. And it's also from Austin stories where 
the heroine is usually drawn between two, maybe the good guy and the bad guy. Sometimes we made that happen, sometimes not. And all of the characters were inspired from Jane Austen characters, but we didn't tell the people who they were, but they got to interpret and got to kind of go from there. So then, then th this time we left more time for the players, but we also had game masters and we also pro promoted transparency, so no secrets. And just to give you an example here, I find our schedule. This is the schedule for workshop. This is like, <laughs> it's, you know, very like, yes, you should be here at this time. This is your romance group. This is your family group. This is where you should dance. So of course we super planned our pre-workshops. So they weren't like, go around and do what you want. It was more like, here are you in the groups and so on. Okay. So, and um, this was, um, my talk thank you very much for listening do we have any questions or things and evan are you happy with what you hear do you want to know something else ah uh, thank you so much anna and and i think my happiness is secondary to to all of this but i i, I yes i'm quite happy <laughs> um we will uh, go into the discussion in earnest. Uh, one question we did have was, is there a re recording somewhere about this kind of dramaturgy in action? I hope I, I hope the talk itself answered that. So I'll say yes, we, yeah. we answered that. Um, but uh, there are plenty of resources also related to Nordic LARP. You really can just sort of look it up online and, and, um, and this form is actually very well documented, which is yeah. nice. I um, yeah, this, I think it, I may have written something about adaptations in some Cluedo book books that were, that, but it was pre-pandemic. That's right. Uh, it, if you can look up uh, Knutepunkt books, that's uh, that, that's one for the the uh, the, the live interpreters. Uh, it's K N U T E P U N K T is one spelling of it, and and that that is a is is over twenty years of role playing theory from the Nordic tradition. Um, I have two different questions, one concerning external stakeholders and one concerning the players themselves. Uh, Ed Chang uh, wrote on Twitter was, uh, you know, how do you deal with the freedom and um, constraint issue in LARP, especially with an existing text or historical event? So can players change the outcome or history of facts and how how do those changes then, um, you know, create a certain tension with that with the work? Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah, I would say like when you do small events such as Sense of Sensibility and you're five people in a room, and then I usually say to my players like, hey, we're five people in a room. If nothing works, then, you know, make sure it kind of, we can change things. We are more important than the story. That's my general kind of. And as for a nice evening, it's also, that's why the trick is to keep the play, play group small. So everyone can like follow and then you can make changes as you go along. And since a nice evening is placed at about 100, 150 years old almost nowadays, then you can also like you needed to modernize them. And like because I placed it in nowadays and then, of course, some changes were made. But I have, uh, yeah, the, um, in, a, in a doll's house, uh, a play by Ibsen, it's a super, it's, it's a big uh it was a big feminist play when it came out in 1879 and it ends with that the wife leaves her husband because it's that their marriage doesn't work and in my round when I play that wife I didn't like we hadn't gotten it bad enough we hadn't built done the prep work so to speak so I was like am I going to leave three children here and move out to, and it was also very real, move to like from a very nice fancy apartment to a very little small with my, and le like, and Nora leaves her kids and that was a, the wife leaves her kids and that was a big debate at the time. So I actually didn't leave my husband. I could feel Ibsen rolling around in the grave. But then again, it's like, yes, what's the payoff here? And yeah, so I thought maybe I, it, it's still like, it was fun. So people have changed the stories. And um, some, it's another story we have in another play we have in that where it's like, it's basically the husband who's gambling, gambling and his wife and his like, his promises to stop, his wife believes him, he gambles again, he promises to stop, his wife believes. And 
and that kind of circle. And I think it's the play they do it once or twice. And at the LARP, I think they did it 10 times where it was like again and again, yes, no, I'm not going to gamble your money away. And then he did it. So, so there are adjustments to be made. And I think just as long as the players agree, and if the players want to do something completely different, then I'm thinking, do that. Like, but as long as they agree, because I think that's where it can, if one players expect us to, and that, that has happened a few, I've seen that happen. If one players expect that we were going to do this and the other player did, wasn't along that train, then of course it can be um, problematic between the players. Like, oh, but I thought you were going to do this. Uh, I thought you were going to quote me this act because that's what I read there. Like, no, no, I thought I was going to do that. But then, of course, that's misunderstanding. And that happens between people off game and everywhere. And that's, you know, sad. so I think, yeah, hope I gave some type of answer here. So, people are more important with stories. Keep the group small. And disappointment comes from unstated expectations that are very yes. important that people cling to. Uh, this uh, next question comes from Jason Morningstar and is directly uh, applicable. Um, it is um, an act structure requires consensus and buy-in from the participants who need to obey whatever arbitrary boundaries you impose, like no violence until Act Three. What so, technique? Sorry. What was that? Uh, sorry, could you repeat? Yeah, of course. Um, so an act structure requires consensus yeah. and buy-in from the participants, and they need to obey these arbitrary rules, mm -hmm. um, like no violence until act three. Yeah. What techniques do you use to get everybody on the same page in an agreement? And then what do you do when an act by boundary agreement is unintentionally violated, like someone uses act? Uh, violence in act two. Uh, it, it, yeah. This happened to me actually in April when I was playing, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the opera LARP, right? By, by, yeah. by, by um, what's it called? Uh, um, one sec. Well, in, in any, in any uh, case. John Cole. No, no, opera buffa is that large. Encore, yeah. encore. Yes. Ah, Maria Jeppe's game. Yeah. Yeah, Maria Maria Hamming's game, uh, which yeah. which I, I'm happy to talk about more. But uh, you know, I, I crossed the Act Three boundary in Act One. Uh, and I we we negotiated that out as players because we were all fine, but we definitely violated the rules almost immediately. So the, the Flying Dutchman and I was going to the end of the Flying Dutchman at the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think these are, these are big design questions. So, mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you do to get people on the same page and how do you patrol those boundaries? Yeah. Okay. So first, how do you get people on the same page? And that's, I think is an information design question, like as a basic, and of course, what, what I always do when I produce things is that I send out like a nice looking PDF where all the information is so you don't end up on a web page with a, like an information overload you need to be like this is the PDF then maybe some people will read it you, you're you not sure about that if anyone reads it you, you can't count on it being read but you still need to have it so they kind of look at it in the lab maybe someone reads it in the car and so on uh, I'm, I'm very like I have very low like I never count with players doing things before the LARP uh, and then of course you can inform them in a one-to-many group but wh when you talk to many people risk forgetting and so on and that's why I generally always work in small groups in my LARP like we have as a nice evening I think the groups are between three and nine and we think the group of nine is a little bit too big um, so then the, the game master of that group and we have given game masters like little tv presentation cards which they need to go through with all their players so the game masters doesn't forget. So it's like, yes, you have the card, read the card, take the new card, and when you walk through all your cards, then you can like, um, you, you can move on. So I think that's how we get them all on the same page. Like, and of course, then it's like what happens in the game. Like, yes, at some LARPs I've been at, we do like, so act from, you can take a break, an off game break between the acts, but at a nice evening, we do a speech between, I think it's a speech that Mark actually, the, so when this person holds this speech, that's kind of a big thing, then we'll go into act two. So then you know it's act two and so on. And of course you can do a speech or you can do when this improvisational dance happening or when this song is played 
or when this kind of thing I think at one point we had the idea of like going around ringing a bell but then not everyone heard it and it kind of messed up so there need to be like everyone is at the same place and this thing is happening or if you have a sound system you can use that and be like okay when this song or this kind of special noise is being played uh, you can do that and then if people violate this rule or I would I, I don't know if I'm correct but violate sounds to me like if they you know misuse them usually it's people who haven't really understood or maybe it's some wrong and also what I experienced when I play this type of LARP is that sometimes they can go too quickly. Like, um, like you, you start doing things you were supposed to do in act three and act two. And that's also generally like act three is usually shortest because if it's one of those LARP where people die in the end, it's like, yeah, everyone died, LARP's over. Um, so I think that's the, how to like, and that's get players to talk to each other, how they pace it. Uh, and to be clear, like having like what what are you gonna do in Act Three? And I think for for Encore, that's a beautiful LARP that kind of did an opera nice evening with the family. They based on operas instead and do acts. Since this is written for like a festival black box setting, you don't have a lot. You don't analyze the opera and and play from that. You get the opera analyzed and some actions you're gonna do in the acts and sometimes that works but that makes the ownership isn't you haven't figured out that you're going to do this it's not you who said that you're going to do power and then of course it's easier to be mistakes and i would also say that those opera even if those operas are awesome some of them suffer from not being super friendly to adapt to larp settings uh, i was lucky to play cosi van tutte that is basically about uh, it's about it's a who takes whole romance people in disguise and then and we could like loop that story from ever forever no are you in disguise now oh oh my god no you don't love me blah blah but other stories i think had a bit of harder time uh so but to yeah and then of course we have the people who just are you know aren't really on beat you know who can't, who does really the wrong thing and then you can always be can we talk about this come on maybe you know but I, yeah true. I think the answer is I don't have a very good answer it's communicate because of course it's always hard you don't want to go to a player and say you're playing this wrong <laughs> like, you want to be like okay this is good but maybe we can save this for that and like but it has it sometimes I felt like okay this play may not have grabbed the atmosphere truly that we're going here but I think most of the time players understand. And then if you're in like a freeform setting when you're five people in a room, I can just retake scenes, which I do. I'm like, okay, this didn't, or like, okay, but we did it like this. Could we try it a little more than this? So on. Uh, a classic is there when I'm gonna make two people fall in love and I'm like having them in the library. And then I'm like one week later, she read the book, she loves it and like, okay, and after enough, enough weeks have passed and I feel there's a spark, then I'm like, okay, now we can move on. So yeah, a big answer on a small question, I think. I hope I answered something. I, I think bringing up replaying is very uh, interesting too, because that's also a technique from uh, what we call the Jeep form era uh, of the late yeah. 2000s, early 2010s. And you were part of that movement too, when, when that was around, um, where you, yeah, you just ask people to redo the scenes. And sometimes you do it in a loving way, like, so it opens up the scene and turns it into something else. And sometimes you do it as a Kubrick way, where you are <laughs> brutally hammering the scene into the players having them do it five six seven times like in a bad theater production and that also has an effect um so i i think uh that that technique is uh is, is not only of an era but also still effective and can be used uh still to this day to kind of uh calibrate player failure and player expectation yeah. And I'm guessing the advantage of having a story is that you know what you're going for. Like, okay, here, here we need to have these people fall in love or 
they need to break up and so on. And then you can just do scenes depending on what you what you want to achieve. Like for example, if I'm game mastering a game where two people is breaking up, I always play the scene where they get to sit ha- sit and become together because they hold hands and they're like, we're gonna be together forever. We love each other so much. I'm like, cut, break up. And of course, then it hurts much more. And that's the point, yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm very much a product of the Jeep, Jeep form and part of that, so. So we may have some people who, who did join because they said, oh, this is someone from Free League and, uh, and you don't have to answer too much to your work with Free League, but, but um, I'm sure, sure some of our listeners are curious about that work. So yeah, I can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I'm since three years back, a little more, I'm the event manager for Three League. That means I'm the one who is, um, you know, setting up, creating their presence on events. For example, GenCon that is coming up. I'm like renting the booth, making sure there's stuff, having tables, having backdrops, fixing flights. So it's practical, but also sometimes a bit marketing strategical and like, Getting, getting stuff to work, but mostly like practical. And we have, since Free League is growing, which is super fun. And I'm, yeah, this is of course also, I'm, sometimes it's so funny. Our hobby is so, it's kind of small, but still within this smallness, we're also like, yes, we are doing more tabletop. And I have spoken very much now from a dramatically large perspective and so on. But yeah, so, and since Free League has grown a lot the last, three years like with alien and one ring and so on of course our presence at american game fair has has grown and we're going to do it's going to be gen con pax east dragon con we will be up in the artist alley selling alien and game home con and there's one i forgetting shooks we're going to be at for the first time uh, in vancouver So that's, um, yeah, uh, do we have an, yeah. So I'm, I'm organizing those basically. I, I find there's a little bit of a gap then between, you know, your much more sort of Jane Austen focused work, um, you know, that's not associated with Free League. Then Free League is, is uh, you know, working on these really established um, uh, science fiction and other properties or intellectual properties. Do, do you see those as compatible spaces where you're doing adaptation over here and then um, adapting a more commercial, you know, uh, science fiction or other properties over on the other end? I'm guessing it's like, you know, when I, I think it was in 2015, I started my event company and that of course I did because I organized a lot of LARPs and I done practical works and then you're like good on that. And then when they at some point needed someone to do their events, I happened to be there as the like, number one event manager in the, uh, Swedish, in the geek scene of Sweden. Um, so, and I thought that was fun to like experience what they do and learn more about that type of in our hobby. Like since this is much more dice and tabletopy and not the background I have, but I have, I'm like, I'm exploring that and like thinking how can you work with dices and that kind of, it's a whole, it's another world from this I'm coming from, uh, but I, of course, play a lot of that too, and played Alien. And I like that, for example, Alien has a very cinematic approach to things. They want to do like short, short adventures that cinematic that should feel as a movie. And I'm like, yes, here, 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 we're talking my language. And I like the Alien kind of story because of that also. And there they also die in the end, which you know seems to fit my, my Nordic taste. Um, so I would say it's of course, like it's different kind of setting like, but there are, I think it's so funny that ho- our hobbies are like, we have our different tracks where we kind of work in and we have our small communities. And then when I look over to, to Free League, I'm like, yes, Alien, that game has act. The characters has personal agendas. I'm like, yes, this is the same. Uh, but of course, I don't write or produce any games for free. I do, I do the events, like, but 
since I've done Stockholm Snare Festival, that's a role playing festival. I'm like, yes, you wind up the game masters, you make sure everyone has the information, you make a schedule. So it's kind of similar, similar work. And one of my aims, like for example, when I did Stockholm Snare Festival, I had discovered that, okay, in Denmark, in festival, that's a big role playing conference there. Uh, they played all of these kind of parlor games, short games, role-playing games. And I'm like, these games are really good. Why don't my LARPer friends in Sweden, who defines as LARPers with full costume and such, um, um, why don't them, they like play this? Uh, why don't they? So then I started the Stockholm Snare Festival where I basically imported those games and got people to play them in Stockholm. And hence I made the Danish scene bigger. And I also gave the Swedes some more to do because generally my idea is like, yeah, since I'm a LARPer from the beginning, I'm like, yes, four days in a forest is awesome, but sometimes more magic can be achieved in four hours in a classroom. Uh, and that I find with freely games as well, that it's like some of them are really like you can, and it's of course what you like. Like if you're like, yeah, I want to slash monsters and roll dice. That's fun. I'm an, uh, oh, what is it in English? Like all eater. I eat everything. <laughs> I think that can be fun as well. But I'm guessing I'm, I've been in my kind of art, sounds super pretentious, but in my, I've been more struggling to how to, how to create dramaturgy, how to tell stories, how to make people involved. And that's what I've been going for. But it's, it's fun to meet some of the writers of Freeling and talk to them and like, uh, how, how do you how do you write? What do you think about? How do you so? It's a fun environment to be in and like see. So I'm guessing it's like you know, yeah, different. I don't know if I should say something more. Do we have any questions? I can, I can't tell anything secret. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I, get, I can I can definitely say uh, you know there, you're sort of approaching a maybe universal language then shared between these different role playing uh, tracks as you call them that are still you know very distinct from other other ways. Um, and it's like funny because I I my belief and you're the researcher people here so maybe you can answer me like that somehow this uh, free form kind of that came from role playing games such a such as freely games like the mutant games and so on and then you someone just figure out to skip the dices and set scenes and more do more like theater in thingy so so they, they are related um but i think yeah i always i never i i thought these books were so thick and the systems were so big so i was kind of but now that i play them i'm like yeah no it, it you know you can read it's not that hard so it's I, I I enjoyed that that too, and I can of course recommend free league games. They're not like I'm not a writer for free league, but I enjoy all of them. I think the we played hobbits in the starter set of the One Ring, and we went around and ate food and were like cozying around in the Shire. Now I'm throwing the Shire, <laughs> but 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 uh, so so there are yeah different type of styles and games. And, and I'm thinking of like er, the early Danish freeform scene, which is doing increasingly complicated games workshop adaptations. So it's like they're taking the Warhammer properties and then exploring like motherhood with them, or yeah. or you know fascism, or you know, the, it, take, taking these these very established properties and then and then warping the the play to the the point where it's commenting on something very different. Uh, but it's still, you know, a Warhammer 40k yeah. production yeah. that you play at a game, a game festival. Mm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm hoping there will be like crossovers to like, could I, could I use Dices in a type of game I do and how to do that? And then of course, and like, since I, the storytelling I'm doing is often quite straightforward and not like very system based, like, for an example, in Alien, I love that really you have the stress dice. So the more stress you do, the more dices you get. And it helps you in the beginning, but in the end, you just, you know, freak out because you're too stressed and may end up sitting in a corner and crying instead of running from the alien. Uh, and, and I haven't done like how to, in, you know, do systems and implement them in games in that type of way that really are very talented. In. So I think that's also like, 
yeah, you could, I think there should be crossover and we should all steal from each other because we're all like cousins and second cousins and I don't know, you know, we're like, we're like the Shire, we're like the small Hobbit family. And then of course, some people sit a bit more there and some do that, but we should, you know, work together and so on. All right, we have a question from Sarah Lynn Bowman, which is, uh, what do you do if LARPers end up become strongly against following a certain dramatic arc halfway through the LARP, again, related to other topics we've been looking for? Yeah. I don't think I, I don't think I experienced that, that I like a little like a LARP revolution, like, um, yeah, I'm guessing like the small groups control has its advantages, like, um, but then again, like when the LARP is rolling, you, 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 you can't do much as an organizer. Like I was at the LARP very long time ago when there was a fortress and there were two armies and one army attacked the fortress very, very early in the morning. And the intention were just to, you know, make some gravel and walk. But unfortunately the door just fluff because it was very poorly built or something. So, so they attacked the fortress in the morning, everyone in the fortress died. Half the LARP is halfway done, and it was like the organist was like, "Hmm, half our LARP is dead. What do we do?" And then they were like, "Hmm, Dallas, Bobby, doing? It's a dream." And so I thought that was kind of neat as well, because it of course made the people inside the fortress much more scared after that, because they all had this very realistic dream about how they died. So that. That was, of course, a trick that turned out to work, work very well. But I don't know, I don't have any like good... I think if the play is going in another direction, maybe that's the, the direction the LARP is going to. And my general experience is that players tend to walk too fast. <laughs> that, that's the thing you need to do as an organizer, like, no, we're not getting there until there, and like how to, to pace it especially when you have organic play like especially with scientists right the process of scientists science is you know sustained inquiry if you're doing science in a larp yeah. and they're they're sort of dripping you plot line and then there's a big dramatic reveal that they didn't want to show you earlier and it makes you all look like fools and now you're fool now your foolish scientists still have two more days of larp to go when they've been disproven, what do they do? You know, is that the arc that we want them to have or not? Yeah. Uh, the, the, these are all dramaturgical questions, right? Even when we think, oh, this is the drip of, of information we're going yeah. to get. Well, they're going to act really quickly. They're going to do experiments and find things. Well, if they find out yeah. the plot within half an hour of the LARP and there are now two days of LARP to go. L luckily oh. i work with most transparent larps like after a friend of mine was like no secrets no secrets so then it's like the players know what's the the solution to this plot is so then the players can break themselves or if they find the solution they can maybe disprove it and they, they can do the loping thing and like no it's not true yes it's true or i i don't know i'm guessing they can also go to the organizers and ask for a new plot and like okay we saw this how but it depends on I have never done a LARP where it's like plot solving is a big like, yeah, you need to solve this. But of course, then again, some of my relationships LARP is like, yes, I need, if I know that the two of you, like, when do I as the wife find out that my husband is cheating, if that's what happened, when is that? And that's how do you information design in the game? Like, when do you put things? And of course that can mess up sometimes. So I think there have probably been some times when people are like, no, this didn't work. Let's just retake this. Um, so, yeah we, have, yeah. we have another question from Jason related to the previous question. Um, uh, he recalls the in-character, out-of-character revolution that Anna and Jason specifically faced in College of Wizardry <laughs> Run 6 together. I, I, I didn't, don't know this war story. Uh, yeah, I can, I can tell the war story of Jason. <laughs> No, it was, um, I was the headmaster of a college of wizardry. That's a Harry Potter inspired LARP where you have a school. Uh, and um, uh, I wanted to, and as the headmaster, of course, you have like hundred and all intrigues climb to you and you have, and this LARP has very little dramatic. This is like sandbox Harry Potter. You have classes, you have teachers, come on. And I was like, and Harry, yeah, I was the headmaster. So I wanted to like, how can I insert drama in this LARP? 
to like make do stuff that affects everyone and everyone think is fun because that's kind of my role uh, and there was a very troublesome student and I did what any good teacher would do I switched class on him I changed house on him as it were in the Harry Potter books and this started a little LARP revolution so I suddenly had a revolution on my hand people being very angry outside my headmaster's room, the, the teacher's lounge and everyone was like, and then it's like, it's also hard when you have like 30, 40 people being just angry and upset because I don't know magic for real, spoiler alert. Like I can't go out and just shh, be quiet. I didn't know how to. And then of course, Anna thinks, okay, how can I give them something so they feel they have won? I have apparently done something they're not happy about. What, what can I like? So me and Jason fled from the back of the teacher's lounge and like, okay, and fled and to not run into this mob because we're like, nothing good will come of this. Like, yeah, what are they going to do? Like strike the headmaster down? Like, or should I just be able to influence magic and make all these 40 people hear what I'm saying that like, no, 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 that wouldn't work like so. So we fled and went to the organizers room and like, OK, shit, what are we going to do? And then we got to have a little meet video to do like negotiation with the prefects of this different house. I think we talked some off game and then I don't know, I offered the prefect something, something. I, I, I bribed everyone with house points. That was my very moral Harry Potter ish. Yeah, the people that took the troublesome uh, troublesome student, I think, got, I don't know, it was 20, 30, I don't know, maybe even 100 house points to take him on. <laughs> this is very, so, so, but then I, I gave them something, something, and we went out together. And I think I promised to do, start a student council, to hold an election, to have like, yeah, to start a committee, like, yes. And this is all stuff that happens after the LARP, so it doesn't really matter, but then yeah, I'm thinking when you have like those power characters, you can do stuff. And I think all of those students who had that revolution felt it felt very important to them. And I, I, I yeah, I was going to apologize in one of my speeches. So I apologized and said, I'm so sorry. La, la, la. So, so because, of course, if a student make a revolution, they should win. I'm the, the authority, authority person here. I should lose, but I don't want to do it in like an ugly way where 40 people scream at me in a hallway. Like, but I, yeah. So that, that's that war story. But and how it, you can like, as, an, as a, a high status character affect the LARP in the game. I think, I think yeah, that your dramaturgy principles from earlier where you're saying, well, you're scripting social situations. How do you script a person facing a mob, right? Which is also a social situation, right? And and you are now in that social situation and you have to first say, do I consent to this? <laughs> and second, how do I uh, deal with this both as a player and as a character? Yeah, my, my I, I chose to run and I forgot my wand in the teacher's love. So I'm like, shit, I don't have my wand. How do I do that? But yeah, that's also like way, way to handle it. <laughs> So we're, we're re reaching the end of our time. And I would ask you, Anna, if you have any final words uh, for our participants um, or, or the audience on YouTube uh, um, uh, in posterity uh, for, for them about, about um, you know, your, the content of your, your talk. Yeah, um, um, yeah, thank you for listening. And then I'm just going to say, organize and write LARP, an interactive thing, experiment with different thing. And Someone asked me once, like, uh, where, where do you want to go? Or what, what, what do you know what's fun? And where do you want to? And I, I said on my best Swinglish, I go where it smells nice. So go where it interests you and where you kind of find a passion. And like, oh, I want to do about this thing. Um, so, and in my case, I have, yeah, selected very like Jane Austen and stuff because I think that's fun. Uh, so go on your, find your geekdom and follow your star. What do they say in Sound of Music? Cli climb every mountain. So that's my kind of last words, I think. Thank you, uh, Anna. And also thank you to Beth and Cassandra for interpreting. Um, we, are, we are so very grateful for all three of you uh, for today's uh, uh, presentation. And um, we will be back here in 45 minutes. Uh, for the two o'clock panel, uh, Magic, Celebrity, and Industry. Thanks, everybody. And I turn 
uh, things over then to Aaron and others.